Today we're going to be talking about qualitative field research. Qualitative field research is an explanatory type of research where we're looking at non-numeric data. Oftentimes we're trying to understand what's going on in the social world, not by taking numbers or counting up various aspects of the social world, but instead trying to sort out experiences, feelings, meanings about what's going on in the environment around us. Often it's called a data-centric method, meaning that it works from the ground up, starts at the data, and then builds theory. So it's an inductive method of investigation. It's best suited for certain kinds of investigations, certain kinds of questions. It's best suited for answering questions about practices or attitudes, social roles, relationships, interactions, groups and cliques, the nature or the character of organizations, investigating subcultures. These are all topics that are suited for qualitative research. Qualitative research is best for hard to reach population. Let's say you wanted to investigate attitudes about politics amongst a subculture of punk musicians from 1981 to 1983. Because there are likely very few people within a subculture, within a subgenre of a musical style, it'd probably be very difficult. So instead, you want to understand people's experiences. While it may not be representative of entire populations, it could provide some insight into perhaps other subgenres within punk or punk generally or rock and metal generally. So it's really about getting on the ground, getting your hands dirty, so to speak. Grounded theory is at the heart of qualitative investigation. A lot of qualitative work may sound like work done in archaeology or anthropology. In grounded theory, we really focus on using the data, using our observations to create theory, explanations for what's going on in the social world. Instead of working the deductive way, meaning we're working from literature and then looking at our observations and saying, hey, the theory explains what's going on, we work the opposite way. We say, what are the patterns that exist in the data set? And then start building theory out from there. So grounded theory is an inductive approach. It's just saying you're starting at the ground with your observations and moving upward. And you do grounded theory by analyzing common patterns or themes or categories that exist amongst a bunch of the observation. You're looking for patterns in the data, not looking to fit a particular theory or argument to the data. So there are various stages in qualitative field research. The first is developing your materials. You figure out how you're going to collect the data or select your observations. So you decide on whether or not you're going to use a survey or you develop an interview guide and experiment. All of these are sorts of materials and the procedure has to do with the way in which you're going to collect these observations. A big part of designing is IRB. We talked about the ethics of social research. We can minimize risk and harm to our participants. Anonymity and confidentiality are important. You have to write up an IRB application and wait for approval. Until that's done, you can't start collecting data. Next, we move on to data collection. Actually sitting down, living in these spaces, talking with participants, observing what's going on for a period of time. It could be a month, it could be a couple of days, it could be years that you're in these spaces, talking to participants, recording observations. After you've finished all of your data collection, the next step is to transcribe the interview or translating all of the notes we took about these spaces or the pictures that we took in these spaces to text. So you oftentimes take an actual recorder to the field, whether that's your phone, doing a voice message, or taking an electronic recorder and recording what participants are saying, and then translating that to text that you can look at later on. You have to think when you're writing these responses up, you need to have the actual response in front of you. You can't just think back to, well, what did the respondent say? You want to have the actual text in front of you of what they said. Next, it's analyzing the data. So in qualitative research, while you're out in the field, you're taking notes, you're saying, oh, this sounds a lot like what another participant said. Make a note to yourself. You start transcribing, you look at, okay, this is where they said this one thing that reminded me of another participant who said something similar, right? So you're making connections across participants. So analyzing is the point at which you're realizing that there may or may not be patterns about what people are talking about, themes that cut across. So if you're looking at, for example, protest participation, you might notice that this one participant said, you know, it's really about my friends being at the protest event. And another person said, yeah, it's about having family and people I know at the protest event. That starts to indicate to us that there might be a common theme about these social ties being important to participation. Finally, it's writing up those results, writing up your analysis, making an argument, building theory. In that example I just gave, I was building a theory about social ties. So writing up the argument that 
protest participation is often about social ties and based on my investigation of these participants this is the evidence of why social ties matter and here's the actual text of what my respondent said when they were talking about social ties being important there are various approaches to qualitative research we can have an interview one-on-one -on -one kind of thing ethnography sort of sitting in spaces observing what's going on participant observation really has to do with cultures subcultures organization deciding whether or not you're just going to observe them or if you're actually going to participate in those organizations cultures groups case study is looking at a critical case an important case looking at one person who has this unique background that you want to investigate a focus group is much like an interview, however, it's not just with one person, it's with multiple people. Focus groups can be 10, 15, 20 people, and you're trying to interview them all at once. You pose a question to the entire group and allow people to talk to one another and answer together or bounce ideas off of one another. And then we have content analysis, which is analyzing the text of either an interview or a written work that exists. Qualitative fieldwork methods can be both obtrusive and unobtrusive. Obtrusive methods are direct observations. You're interacting directly with your subjects or participants, so you're directly observing what's going on. Yeah, these include interviews, ethnographies, participant observations, case studies, focus groups, and indirect observations or unobtrusive methods are those that don't affect social life. So things like content analysis or historical case studies. And we say that they do or they don't affect social life because after the interview or after the interaction with subjects or participants, they know that they were interviewed or they know that they participated in research, so it may or may not change how they behave in the future. They may encounter harm during your direct observation. Remember, we don't want to do that, but they may be adversely affected in some way. So that is having an effect on someone's life. Unobtrusive methods don't have that effect. Content analysis is analyzing text. You can analyze pictures. You're not directly working with or observing participants, but you're analyzing things that have been collected by others, and you're analyzing those documents or objects. Historical case studies are much like content analyses. Let's say we want to look at the Nixon trials. We'd analyze texts and documents and interviews that existed during that period to identify causes and consequences. Let's first get into these obtrusive methods. The interview. We have a one-on-one -on -one interview with participants. You're working one-on-one -on -one with somebody asking questions. And these questions are based on interview guides. So you're not just going out into the field and asking people random questions. What's necessary is what we call an interview guide, which is a set of questions, 10 questions, 20 questions, 100 questions, that are designed to uncover experiences. So you're trying to glean people's attitudes or experiences or belief systems from these questions. This interview guide is based on some predetermined themes. In my example, I say social ties might be related to protest participation. So I say, okay, I ask them about their protest participation. Can you tell me more about your experience participating in protests? And then I ask them, why do you think you went? Can you explain more about what pushed you to go out and protest? Then I'll ask if they had friends that went to the protest or anybody they knew going to the protest. If so, could they describe them? If not, why do they think that was? Next, I'll ask about whether or not they had time. That would be another set of themes about protest participation. Maybe it's about money, so I'll have a set of questions that are based on the theme of money in protests. So you have questions listed under a set of topic areas, and those topic areas are themes. It's important to note that interviews in this manner shouldn't be structured. We usually follow a semi-structured design in that we have a set of questions, but it's not our job to just mark off each question as people answer. What we want to do is develop a relationship with this person. We don't want to seem like we're interrogating them. We want to make it conversational. The more conversational we can make it, the more free the participant is to open up. They may feel more comfortable opening up or sharing more about their experiences. If you're badgering them with questions, they may just want to finish the interview really quickly and may not go into depth about what you want to know. We don't want to just give them surface level questions like, did you have friends go with you to the protest event? That kind of question would warrant a yes or no response. We don't want yes or no responses. We want something that would allow the participant to elaborate a little bit more, talking about and thinking through why they didn't have friends or why they did have friends at this protest event and whether or not that was a catalyst for them participating. We want to be a traveler rather than a miner. We can think of a miner, somebody who's going out and searching for gold and they're picking trying to get to the answer or trying to get to the reward. And the minor kind of interview, you're asking yes and no questions, you're just trying to get through the list till you get to the final result. The traveler 
allows the participant to go on a journey with you or the participant is taking you on a journey through their experiences. You know, they'll tell you, I had class that day and I couldn't go. So the traveler sorts of interviewer, which is what we want to be, we allow the participant to take us on a journey. And through that journey, we can see the depth of their connection with these questions. Ethnographies are descriptions of what's going on in a social space. The researcher spends extensive time in a setting and they record all of their experiences. So they record the sights, the sounds, the smells, the tastes, the sensations, the feelings that they're having. So ethnography can work with interviews and it can be completely separate from interviews. There are so many researchers out there who combine ethnography and interviews or case study with ethnography. And ethnography can be part of a larger set of methods that qualitative researchers can employ. An ethnographer, let's say they're interested in interactions at dog parks, so they'll sit on a park bench and watch dogs interact with one another. They'll describe the owners of the dogs. They'll describe the interactions between owners. They want to transport you to that social setting as if you were actually there. There is a qualitative researcher named Mitchell Dunier who does a good ethnography of Greenwich Village in New York called Sidewalk. You may want to check that out. On ethics pseudonyms are going to be important. So you go into these social settings and you're describing what people are saying to one another, but you want to keep them anonymous and you want to keep their more private information confidential. And to do this, you have to give our participants pseudonyms, fake names. Participant observation, it's a combination of ethnography and just being the researcher on the outside. So it's living in or making frequent visits to a setting, or you can participate in the activities of a setting. Usually this works with organizations or countercultural groups that are hard to um, connect with. For the researcher, they need to decide, are you going to be participating in the activities of this group, or are you going to just sit on the outskirts and watch? There's a spectrum from full participant to full observer. And you can be a full participant, meaning you're participating with this group, you become close friends with the other participants, right? So now you are becoming one of them. Or you can be on the complete opposite, where you're a complete observer. Watching this group interact with one another, maybe you're watching a PTA meeting, and instead of becoming a member of the PTA, a full observer would just be on the outskirts, sort of standing by the door, watching, taking notes, things like that. This is important because when you're trying to use qualitative methods to go in depth, you don't want to seem like a researcher who stands off to the side taking notes, sort of judging everyone. Next we have focus group. So focus group is much like an interview, however you're just interviewing multiple participants together. So you're allowing for further discussion of topics. This is important, especially if you're at the beginning stages of your research project, you're not sure what kind of questions work. So you start piloting your survey or your questions. You start a focus group and they'll bounce ideas off of one another and that will help you develop your research question a little bit more. Maybe somebody will say, well, when you asked that question, I was thinking this, but it made me also think about this other thing, which allows you, the researcher, to incorporate that other kind of question or other aspect of that question to your own question. And then we have case study. Case study is an in-depth examination or analysis of one case. Case study we use to develop an ideographic understanding, meaning we want to look for the particulars of this case. What are all the things that led up to this outcome in this specific case? You can study one person's experience in the legal system, for example. They were pulled over by the cops at this point in their life, and they got pulled over again for having bad tags on their car, and then they got a ticket for speeding. So like all of these explanations for why they ended up maybe not going to school or ended up doing drugs or in rehab, right? So in a case study, we look for all the possible explanations for some kind of outcome in a specific case. And we can use that as the basis for studying other cases if we wanted to. But usually it's just developing a full picture of what's going on in a specific case. You might think of a case study as one of those documentaries that we would see on Netflix where we're investigating all the things that happen in these people's lives that may have led to a certain outcome. Next, we have unobtrusive qualitative methods. These are the methods that aren't direct observations of social life, but they are based on data that already exist. A historical case study is an in-depth examination, much like the regular case study, but is based on prior human-recorded communications. It's usually based on text or recordings, and it's looking at those ideographic explanations for what's going on in these cases. A historical case study looks back because we can't interview those people, we can't talk to them. 
And then content analysis. It's the study of human communications. Usually it's text. If it's recordings like videos or speeches, those recordings are translated into text. So we're trying to figure out who says what, to whom, why, how, and with what effect. Here are some best practices for what we do in qualitative research. We talk about this idea of gaining entree or gaining access to a group. It's important to figure out if you're studying a specific social group, how are you going to get access? Are you going to become one of the people who exist in those groups, developing relationships with these people? So it's important to decide, are you going to try to develop relationships and gain trust of the people you want to study? Gaining entree is an important part of that. Developing relationships with gatekeepers, people who can give you access or vouch for you, it's important. And once you gain access or are introduced to gatekeepers, it's about strengthening that relationship. That way the gatekeepers can go back to the group and say, hey, this researcher is a cool person. I can vouch for them. They're not trying to harm us, but want to learn about us. Again, when we're a participant, do we want to be a full participant? Do we want to be a full observer? Are we a researcher? How does researcherness fall into this process? We have to know that as a researcher, when we're doing qualitative research, especially those obtrusive methods, we're going to run into what we call reactivity, meaning that our participants are going to react based on us being a researcher. If we are a full observer, they're likely going to react like, who's over there watching us? Why are they watching us? What are they trying to do to our group? Or do you want to be a full participant? Or are you going to become one with the group? That way you are accepted. So reactivity is just knowing that they may not act how they would normally act because your presentation of self as a researcher. So it's really about reflexivity, looking back on your own positionality and figuring out how do you fit into this space and how can you not step on the toes of the participants that you aim to be learning about and helping. Again, you begin with a general question, does X lead to Y? But you don't let that question guide the research. So you ask about Y, you ask about X, you ask about their attitudes, you ask about the perceptions of X, maybe about Z, you ask about A, B, C as well. All of these things are important. It's important to also rely on open-ended questions. You don't want to rely on questions that can be answered with yes, no, I don't know kinds of responses. So questions that allow for the opportunity for elaboration. Again, I mentioned the semi-structured interview. We want to develop a set of questions, but when we're engaging in the interview, we want to loosely follow it, let the participant guide us on a journey. So I say minor versus traveler. And then it's also important to ask for permission from your participants if you can digitally record their interview. Ask them if it's okay for you to record them because you'll be using it at a later date. Take notes, but also don't spend too much time taking notes. You're listening to their responses, you're sort of engaging in conversation much like you would be engaging with people in a conversation at a party, but you're taking notes on various topics to remind yourself. It's important to go back after the interview, after the ethnography, after the qualitative observation and rewrite your notes. Start thinking about what was said, what your notes mean, clean them up a little bit so they're legible, maybe start transcribing. Again, when you're in these spaces, you should be taking notes, make memos to yourself, write memos of these conversations afterwards that could be used in your analysis. So I have a bunch of notes on different kinds of memoing practices. You could define concepts. You could deal with methodological issues like, oh, well, I asked this question and it's not really working. Maybe I should revise this question. You can offer initial theoretical ideas. So I have a note about this person said something about social ties being important. Somebody else before said that their social ties were important, so I'm making a note that social ties are important for protest participation.